So, Chris, where did you grow up and what's your background? Well, I grew up in, uh, it was in Kent, uh, in uh, a place called Tunbridge Wells. And Kent, as you know, is a sort of considered the Garden of England. It's a, it's a gorgeous place, very, very hilly, unlike Essex. And lots of rocks deposited by the Ice Age, very kindly for us kids to play. Uh, rocks all over the place. And I grew up playing on these rocks and uh, climbing everything that I could possibly climb, uh, much to my uh, parents' horror. So how did you get into academia then? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, uh, is that not what you want to hear, is it? Um, it's an odd uh, sort of story because my, my, my mother died when I was about eight uh, and uh, that really sort of took the, the joy out of the early part of life. And I didn't do well at school. I wasn't really uh, so into school. I sort of survived it. And years later, I seemed to get interested in books and reading um, for different uh, reasons. And late, as a mature student, although maturity is a bit overrated, um, I got into uh, university. I went and did a college course, uh, which was a social sciences college course. But I fell in love with English literature, so I ended up going to do literature. So how did you go from that to sort of an interest in psychotherapy then? So I was studying uh, Robert Graves um, and I was invited somebody asked if I would do a PhD which was you know I'd never dreamed I'd be doing a PhD so I said well, I said yes because I say yes to everything while I was doing that I had to earn a living and I, I, I worked in a children's home and got deeply involved with the young people who were violent self-harming self-destructive uh, young people so I got interested in in trauma and interested in the nature of trauma which seems to be carried unconsciously in other words, people are not aware of it. They can't tell you about what's happened to them, but it's nevertheless pouring out of them organically in their behavior and in their attitudes. And because there was no rational narrative, you have to look to the irrational and the unconscious. You have to, and in fact, I drew upon my literature. I drew upon my understanding of literature where you're looking for metaphors and symbols in, in, the, in, the, in the literature to look at the underlife of these children's personalities. And that gradually took me towards psychoanalysis, gradually. So what or who is your greatest inspiration? There was a guy I met at Kent University called Michael Irwin, who was a professor of English literature. And uh, in fact, I, I still know him now. I visited him a couple of weeks ago. He's an 85-year-old retired professor of English literature. But not only did he support me when I was very, I mean, I wasn't schooled when I got to university. I didn't, I didn't know anything about writing essays or referencing or anything at all. I was hopeless. And he really took me under his wing, gave me a lot of time, and was extraordinarily generous, apart from the fact he'd met Robert Graves, which, which helped immensely. So what are you interested in outside of work? Well, uh, I don't know if there is an outside of work. I mean, I don't have bits of life siphoned off in that way. Some people do, but I, I, I don't really. Work's quite pleasant. You know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not so, uh, I don't know, something you want to get away from all the time. But I do like running. I've run a few marathons and I've run all my life. It's a sort of pattern of life. Um, it's very meditative and uh, relaxing. Once you get over the agony of starting running, when, when she, once you get going, you get fit enough, it's, it's very pleasant. You take yourself out into the countryside and you can have many very good ideas when you're running. You know, there's a certain solitary quality to it, which is, which is quite pleasant. When have you felt happiest or saddest in your life? Uh, uh, happiest? I don't really know. I think happiness is something you, you, you don't always know so much about. Um, but I guess there are times when you're doing something that you should be doing and you're doing it and it feels right. And that could be, uh, you know, spending time with your family. It could be, um, you know, I don't know, climbing the, up the side of a mountain. It could be writing something. But when you know that you're using yourself in the way that you should, there's a certain happiness that comes with that, you know, it feels right. Um, in terms of sadness, well, it weaves itself through life, doesn't it? And sometimes you, you, know, you think back to periods that, that were sad, but they're also moments of, of inspiration. Uh, and sometimes actually working with children um, who, who have undergone extraordinarily difficult experiences are also periods of sadness. 
And if you can't feel the sadness that the children feel, you don't have much to offer them. You have to be able to begin where they begin. And then you have to survive and have hope. And hopefully you draw them with you towards survival and hope. And those moments can be you know, very, very painful and very sad. What do you want students to know about you? Well, uh, the door's open. Uh, that's the uh, first thing to, to say. Uh, I want them to know that, uh, that our, our department is a, is a community um, and I, I want them to know that we'll support them in their, in their learning. Uh, and, uh, and then afterwards, I want them to know that they can make a difference to the world they live in. And that you often think that it's too big a thing to do. That's not true. There are all kinds of differences you can make. Uh, and those differences have effects on many other people. And so the differences and the changes they can make spread. Uh, and so they have, they come into the universe, I think, often feeling, you know, like they, they haven't quite found their power and their oomph. But by the time they leave, I can assure them that they will really have a lot to offer and a lot to give, and they'll be able to make big changes in the world. Do you have a motto that you live by? I suppose you could say that. It comes from one of the translations of the Iliad. Um, the worst thing in the world is to be wise too late. Uh, and I think that's useful because, you know, you only get one shot at life and one shot at living. And it's always good to stop and to reflect and to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And not just to hurt, hurt yourself headlong into things. Uh, because you, you don't get to undo mistakes very easily. But you can correct them before you make them. <laughs>